Welcome to Escafier Online International Culinary Academy. I'm Chef Mark, your mentor for today, and Chef Educator. We're excited to have you with us as we broadcast on the World Wide Web to our, our far-flung students in over 16 countries. So yes, we are internationally acclaimed, and we're a, a very fine program, which includes baking and pastry as well. So we'll tell you more about that later on. But for today, it's our weekly culinary live webcast. We're live, so feel free to type in, join the chat, reduce your screen, you'll see the chat bar on your right. We're happy to take your questions about foods, foods in general, or any questions that apply to your studies. And for those who've joined us today for the first time, we welcome you to become part of our community of cooks. And that's where we're creating an international community of cooks. It's about showing you best practices and sharing your great recipes and techniques with us. After all, we feel we're the arbiter of, of a good education, Auguste Escoffier, the father of modern cuisine, and of course, all his techniques and methods are very classic and well-respected today, even at uh, brick and mortar culinary schools around the world. So we're excited to have you here today. Welcome uh, to our program. What we're doing today is the celebration of uh, Un Fête Nationale, or Bastille Day, a national holiday in France we're doing a classic dish from French cuisine, made popular some years ago. Those who recall the black and white TV days or even color TV days when Julia Child did Julia Child's Beth Bourguignon. So we're doing that today. We're doing a great recipe from, from Chef Julia, her French beef stew with burgundy wine. That's what we're preparing today. I think it always sounds better when it's a, a French name. It's nice to put beef burgundy with noodles on the menu, but all of a sudden you call it Beth Bourguignon with pomme parsier. Well, that's $13.95 a portion. So think about uh, menu uh, merchandising, if should you create a menu for a family or friends or a guest. So making that Beth Bourguignon today, beef, beef stew, different than a daub, different than a stew in the fact that it's actually braised, which means partially covered with liquid, where a stew is totally submerged and in the class of Beth Bourguignon that Julia Child did, uh, pieces of meat are much larger, so we'll be cutting those today for you. So what I've done is bought myself a very nice uh, chuck, um, boneless chuck roast or a boneless chuck steak. This is as thin as, as a gauge as you want. A little thicker is better. We're going to cut this into pieces, two inch, three inch chunks. Oh, and by the way, the recipe is already up, I believe, or will be up shortly for you to look at. So feel free to chat about the best beef stew or beef burger that you've ever had. And what's nice about this is, unlike beef stew, beef stew doesn't usually have any alcohol. Beef burgundy, two cups of burgundy wine. And we'll have that today for you as well. Not to taste, unfortunately, but to use in our cooking. So when you buy the chuck, nice chuck roast, it can be boneless. Easier that way. You can buy yourself a recipe calls for three pounds of uh, a boneless chuck. So we're going to cut it into large sections. The large sections are important to remove some of the fat. And always cut your meat along the interior silver skin. You see that? There's the silver skin that's here. If you follow the natural contours of meat, you really can't go wrong. So I'm going to trim off some of the fat. The beef fat suet can be used for something else. If you do use or collect enough beef fat, it in fact can be used for a British dish, Yorkshire pudding or Yorkshire popovers. Uh, as I was studying cuisine in France some years back, we realized that French culture is wonderful the world over, and their cuisine, also spectacular. Uh, rather poor at being a colonial power, the converse is true with the British, great colonial power, cuisine, not so good. So at least the good contribution of British cooking is some good stews. Certainly they like Beth Bourguignon, and they also like Yorkshire pudding, uh, Yorkshire popovers. So that's what you use with the beef suet or beef fat. So here are some sections here. Let's cut them into large pieces, large chunks, because this stew braises very nicely. 
in a covered marmite or covered pot, which we have. I'll show you that. So you need, just, you need to have a ovenable pot, marmite, casserole, or brazier with a lid so you can fit it into the oven. So there's our meat. We're not going to salt it. It's going to be braised in liquid for a while, so we don't want the salt to reduce that and make it very salty. So this is one of the few dishes that you do not salt the beef before. So trim off some of the excess fat. Oh, some fat is good, because in, in French cuisine or the foods of the holidays in France, fat is their friend, so is some salt. So salt and fat do have their places, just to be sure to use them judiciously and in, in the small amounts, right? So a little fat is good, a little salt is good to make food flavorful. So there's, there's our beautifully cut up chuck. We prefer chuck, then we do uh, the bottom round. I'm going to bring this over to the stove now, then we'll come back and do a few more things. So we prefer to use chuck because of the fat content. This is smoky, smoking hot. We prefer to use chuck as opposed to top or bottom round. Top and bottom round is very lean, right? It's so lean that it doesn't have enough fat at the bottom or top round to give us the taste that we want for a beef bourguignon. We like to use chuck. Boneless chuck roast, a chuck steak, what have you. So we're gonna, see that's, that's on high heat. The pan was heated earlier, right? I got a heavy bottom saute pan. Now, make sure later on I tell you about our trip to France this October. I think that'd be something special for those of you who have not been to France, or even if you have been. You haven't been on a trip with chefs. It's lots of fun. You can imagine what we do as chefs, cooking classes, stuff like that, wine tastings. And a trip to France is lots of fun. Vineyards and uh, olive oil manufacturing, perfume, perfumiers, hot couture, right? Hot cuisine. So if it sounds something that you'd like to participate in, uh, let us know. And we have to send you some information on our trip to France this October. Great time of year to be in France too is October. So as you can see here, I want no flour, which is different than a beef stew also. So the beef stew, traditional Western style beef stew, we'll salt the meat, we'll dredge it in the flour, we'll brown it, and a mirepoix. Of course, this also, not of course, but this does not have a mirepoix, which is 50% onion, 25% Carrot and 25% celery. So no flour, no mirepoix for Beth Bourguignon. And this, the, the, the reason why this dish is popular because it's slow cooked and gives you great flavor. It, it's, and it's a, not a choice kind of meat either. Something the farmer, the, the, the working, working person, 16th, 17th century, we get the less desirable cuts of meat, right? The less desirable cuts of meat, the desirable cuts of meat went to the landlord or someone else, right? The filet, the tenderloin, the ribs, and the chunk, and the bottom round used to move the cattle around. Had to be braised, slow cooking, cast iron pot and water for three, four, five, six, seven, eight hours. So, so this is a peasant dish in effect. As Julia Charles said, uh, when she produced this, on TV, although those many decades ago, and she subsequently did for Julia Child Beth Bourguignon, she mentioned the fact that it's a, a peasant dish. Uh, the fermier, the paysan, and the Let's Desirable cuts were brown to give it color and taste. So it's important to see the flame is, needs to go higher yet. I also started some earlier that I browned off in this other casserole dish. 
because the recipe has three pounds. You don't want to make one pound of bœuf bourguignon. That's no fun because you'll probably eat it all yourself. So the recipe has three pounds of, of nice chuck meat. You can use USDA prime chuck if you want to, a little more marbly, more flavor. Chuck is also great, as you know, for hamburger meat. So let them move around. Uh, and we, uh, look how nice the color is. We don't brown meat to sear in flavor or sear in liquid. That's a fallacy. You brown meat to give it a color. Question coming in. Yes, sir. Uh, if someone asks, is this one of our assessments? Beef bourguignon is not one of our assessments. This is for celebration of Bastille Day. We're doing this special this week. But we do have old-fashioned beef stew, which is very similar, right? Meat's cut smaller, dredged in flour. So the same, same method can apply. So let's brown up nicely, keep it moving. So that nice color that caramelizes the proteins and the liquids that are, you know, the fats or have you that are in in the meat itself, it gives it a great taste. I think <coughs> <coughs> better put the fan on. A good stew has nice caramelized meat flavor. So we're not gonna flambe it, though it looks like I am, but I was tempted, but I'm not gonna flambe it. So we're gonna lower that and we'll turn it off. I'm gonna switch over. It's in my casserole dish. So here's the meat that I started earlier. That's searing nicely. I'm gonna add the rest of my meat, see how nice that looks. Let's see what happens on the bottom. So any extra grease or fat is drained off. Now earlier, when I cooked off the first beef stew, it does take three and a half hours. We certainly don't have that much time together. So I made a beef stew earlier. And what I did was get that burner lit. There it goes. What I did was is I deglazed this beef stew pan earlier. I'm going to show you what to do with it. Deglaze the pan now. So by deglazing the pan, once the meat is removed from that, you're going to have all sorts of little drippings or what they call foam on the bottom. And this was, this was the drippings and the foam from all the meat that I browned earlier. I just showed you some of the meat that I was browning. So this is foam, F-O-N-D. This comes from all the, the liquid and the carbohydrates and the, you know, the, the proteins that reduced in the pan. And that and we're now deglazing with wine. That's important, deglaze the fog. All the little bits of meat that'll caramelize on the bottom of the pan, that's what you want to get up that gives the meat the stew a great flavor. So once we've deglazed that, right, it kind of cleans off the pan too. It makes it easier to wash the pan. Then you want to put that into your you want all that good stuff in there. All the foam, all the drippings, right? We call this in America drippings. You make drippings, you roast the ham, you have the drippings from the ham, you deglaze with coffee, you have red eye gravy. So that goes aside. Now I have just the seared meat, drain out the excess oil where necessary, degreased, and then deglaze the pan. Now this is an oven proof, oven casserole, nice copper casserole, tin line. Next step is, so all, so far we only have the, the, the oil that we seared the meat in, degreased, added some, uh, added our Pinot Noir, our burgundy wine to deglaze and also as part of this, the, the braising liquid. So the recipe, as you can see, three pounds of meat and three cups of 
Burgundy wine. Now you can use any red wine, I guess, but if it's Biff Bourguignon, it should have Burgundy wine. So I'm going to turn that up now. So that's looking nice already, right? It's looking quite fine. So we bring that up to a boil. Then we add two uh, cups of beef stock. And I use, I don't always have time to make beef stock from scratch. There's a lot of wonderful beef stock, prepared beef stocks on the market. That's really smelly and nice already. And we have three hours to go yet to make those pieces of meat fork tender, because it's tough now, right? So let that submerge. So what are our next ingredients? Two bay leaves, you can, Turkish bay leaves are good. They seem to have more flavor than the California bay leaves. You can crack them in half, kind of releases them. Make sure you retrieve them after. Put that in there. We'll need one clove of garlic minced. And a half teaspoon of some thyme, right? And that's one of the great things of, of French cuisine is that you know, through centuries, they know how to use the right amount of spice to everything. I'm not saying that French cuisine is the greatest cuisine in the world, but it happens to be the language of the professional and commercial and home kitchen is, is the use of uh, French culinary terms. So julienne, sauté, brunoise, and all those things uh, one learns as a, as a cook. And then they're used in Western kitchens the world over. If you go to a Japanese kitchen, they'll have culinary French knowledge they'll use that in their cooking processes. Tablespoon of tomato paste. Let's add that to that. Let's combine that as this is starting to simmer now. So combine that tomato paste well. It just gives the sauce just a slight, slight depth to it. We'll sort of get plenty of depth with um, three cups of red wine, right? It just gives a, a, a little acid note to it because of the, the beef flavor. Thyme is, is traditionally served with beef. It's good for that. Rosemary would be too overpowering. What we we'll want to do then is just add a little salt, not very much, just a little bit, maybe a half a teaspoon, uh, so that the beef absorbs that salt that's in the liquid. So we don't want to have too much salt. So it's fine to add some now, because if we would add it before, then it would have been very salty. And as you know, you want to salt towards the end of a stew or a braised dish. A steak you, you would uh, season before. So let's come to a simmer. We're going to put the lid on, and we're going to put that into our oven. It's at a 325 degree oven for about three hours. So while that's braising, let's look at the accompaniment dishes that go with the Beth Bordino. Now also make sure someone asks the question about what did Julia Trial think about August Escoffier. Someone needs to ask me that question later on. So what I have here now is a pan. And what I did was I bought pearl onions or cipollini onions. Sometimes pearl onions not in season. You'll see these flatter Cipollini Italian-style onion. So depending on the time of year, pearl onions are available. Certain times of year, they're not. Cipollinis work nice. What we did was we took these Cipollinis and blanched them 20 seconds in boiling water, and then I peeled them, right? So that by the Cipollini onions, they're small. They look just like this. There's a brown skin on them. I'll take them out of the package little salt in the water, blanch them, maybe in 10, 20 seconds, check and see that the skin has shrunk back from the onion. Take them out and then peel them while they're warm and you have nice chipotle um, onions. These are nice to saute too, they brown up very nicely. 
From this preparation, as uh, Julia Child has showed us, we actually cook them in water and butter. So once I blanch them, remove the skin, it can be refrigerated. And even that beef stew at this point can be refrigerated, the beef bourguignon, done tomorrow. I'm going to put them in some water halfway up. Water halfway up the height of the onion and some butter and a little salt. And let those simmer. And, and it depends how long you had them in the, the simmering water. 15 minutes until tender. So we'll want to check that in a few moments. So I had them on a little earlier. So they're nice and tender. What's nice about these onions, like any onion, you can grill an onion, get that strong taste uh, like on a shish kebab or something, or grilled onions on a grill themselves. They're a little stronger. You want to use the Vidalia or the Walla Walla or the Maui onion. But these are the Chibellini, nice and sweet as pearl onions. They're really nice to have. And they're, they're, they're not so onion, oniony, I guess you could say, when they're, when they're sweeter, when they're smaller and cooked in, this, in the water and uh, some butter. So those, those are nice and tender. Let's push those aside. Now the next item we have for this is, I'm going to go over to the, the cutting board now, while that's doing its job there, is we're going to be preparing the mushrooms for this. <clears throat> So we're happy to take your questions. It's been quiet out there in virtual kitchen land. Any questions? We're happy to take them. So, uh, question, how do you like that? There's a question for you right there. Tell us about what Julia Child wrote about Escoffier. I guess someone took me up on my question, what Julia Child wrote about Escoffier. And, and um, I happen to have um, the book, August Escoffier, Memories of My Life, written by his great granddaughter-in-law. Laurence Escoffier, Michelle Escoffier's uh, wife, deceased. And Julia Child does a foreword in, in this book about him. And she says that uh, he was the master of cuisine. And if he was alive today, we would probably be teaching at a culinary school. Because he, she knew that he taught uh, his people very well. She had great respect for him. And that he was an innovator and great creator of great cuisine. And uh, she wrote a great foreword to this book. So, she had a great respect for uh, La Maitre, the master, and um, she enjoyed his, his dishes, and this is one of them that was made famous in those days. So yeah, thanks for that question. <laughs> Appreciate it. So now we're going to prepare the mushrooms for the Beth Bourguignon. You want to get your basic white mushrooms. And you want to buy them with the caps closed. That's very important that the caps are closed was there fresher. Closed cap means fresher as the gills recede a little older. Jeff, is it true that you should not put mushrooms in water to wash them off? So someone asked uh, that I'm putting mushrooms in water to wash them. And that is what you do do. Is, or you can take a mushroom brush and brush the, the dirt from them. That would take longer if you have to do a dozen, three dozen, five dozen mushrooms. Now, mushrooms do not absorb, do not absorb liquid. Uh, they, they, they don't get soggy. They get soggy when the mushroom cap, when the mushroom gill is receded, as I, as I was just mentioning. As the gill recedes, then they absorb water. But in this format, they do not. We're washing them quickly. We're rubbing between our hands. We lift them out. Look at all the dirt and debris and what have you in there. So I would want to wash mushrooms. And we, in fact, do recommend that you do so. So it is untrue that you don't wash mushrooms. But you can buy a mushroom brush if you, uh, and brush them by hand. It's that's certainly, that's certainly an altern, alternate thing to do. But for food safety, um, I like to wash them. And if the stems look a bit blackened or dirty, I'll cut them off as well. Because, of course, they grow in a different kind of uh, substance, right? Though it's sterilized earth. They don't grow like they used to. So mushrooms are grown in sterilized earth, pretty much. So perfectly dry is important for these mushrooms because we want them to brown. And they won't brown if they're wet. 
So I allowed them to sit a little bit. Then I'm going to cut them. So what we want to do is cut off the stem, cut the stem on the bias, and cut the mushroom into quarters. See that? So we use the stem as well. You have a large mushroom. Cut it into thirds, right? Or about the same size. And then we put them into our mushroom bowl. So here are the mushrooms that I washed and perfectly dried them earlier. Someone asked if they could use lemon juice to keep them white. Um, well, I guess it depends what the use for them is. These are white mushrooms. I wash them, I dry them, I'm ready to cook them. I don't want to add any other liquid to them because I want them to be lightly brown. You can store mushrooms, large mushrooms if you want, in, um, in water. When we used to do deep fried mushrooms, we had to put them in the batter. Um, sometimes we put lemon water, the whole mushroom now, closed capped. Sometimes we put the, the mushrooms in lemon water to keep them white, but yeah, you can do that if you want to, but then they need to be dried perfectly, or unless you're going to put them in a batter. So someone asked what they can use instead of mushrooms in the dish they're allergic to them. You can take them out all together. Uh, what mushrooms do chemically to your palate, it, it affects your taste buds in a way that makes things taste sweeter. So mushrooms have the tendency of making things taste sweeter, like, like, like a beef, you know, it had beef, had the beefy flavor. So mushrooms do that. I don't know what would substitute uh, for, for a mushroom because it, what that chemical reaction does, but certainly you can use something else that you want to put um, green uh, zucchini in there or summer squash, right? That'd be nice to cook it the same way. Buy your summer squash, wash it, quarter it, and then um, you'll want to blanch them first because you wouldn't be able to saute quartered summer squash. So that's a nice idea. Patty pan squash would work nice too. Cut those in half, you can saute those. So um, those are some things you can do. So I have butter now. Go ahead, sir. So I have butter now. The butter's hot. Go ahead, sir. Do you use salted or unsalted butter? So the question was, do you use salt or unsalted butter? Um, oh, I always use sweet butter. Unsalted is fresher. A sweet butter, unsalted butter doesn't have a preservative in it, which is salt. So naturally, it's going to be fresher than salted butter, which is preserved. So always buy sweet butter. But for the table, sometimes people like um, salt, but I put it on bread, right? I like to control the amount of salt in my, in my food. So those are great questions. You know, we really enjoy getting your questions because it, it, everyone can hear and share that knowledge, and you'd be surprised what the knowledge people have when you get food people in one room. The knowledge they have is spectacular. And that's some of the reasons why I enjoy this so much is that because I get to learn something new every day uh, that I'm cooking. So we love those questions. We encourage you to to share them with us and then uh, tell your friends about what a great experience this, uh, this day has been making Beth Bourguignon. So we're going to toss those shrooms. We want them lightly browned. So we want to make sure that the mushrooms absorb all the butter. Um, yes, we use butter. We don't apologize, but we're not using a lot of it. Oh, I don't get the feeling that fat and salt are bad. They're not bad only if you use too much of them or and you're allergic to them or you eat too much of it, right? So everything in moderation. So a nice pan to saute those shrooms, slightly brown. The onions are looking great. Onions are nice. I'm going to move a few of these items out of the way because now I'm going to bring up the stew. We're going to finish our stew. It's almost that time. Before we finish up our stew, um, I'm going to make uh, a beurre manier, uh, a classic uh, a French thickening agent. It's butter and flour mixed together. 
and it's used to thicken up. It's a simple thickener. You know, you have, you have to make a roux and heat the butter and add the flour and cook it. With the beurre manier, you're able to have the ability to thicken up your sauce or soup without too much fuss. So this is the beurre manier we're gonna make. Let that sit there a moment, toss my mushrooms. Want them to be perfectly dry to absorb all that flavor, no additional liquid. Mushrooms, in fact, don't, mushrooms, in fact, should be cooked on, on a liquid like that, in a liquid or grilled. Um, and be mindful, mushrooms don't necessarily like high heat to be sauteed without a liquid. So keep that in mind. So get my bourmonier, bourmonier hand butter. Uh, a few pinches are used to thicken up. It's a quick thickener, which we use for our soup or stew. You can see the texture now is like, like a wet sand. Someone asked, how do you know that the mushrooms are done? Um, the mushrooms are done when they're tender and all the liquid is absorbed. So you can see, uh, it has that wonderful cooked mushroom smell. It's quite spectacular, uh, how that, what that adds the flavor. So they're done because they're nice and tender. They're soft, but still firm. So. You taste one too, that's a good way to tell if a mushroom's done. Give it a little taste and see. So there's our bourmonier, right? And that we just mix together and there it is. See, it's like a little, a little putty. You're gonna use, it's a tablespoon of butter, three tablespoons of flour, used to thicken an hour, or a stew. Now let's see how our stew is doing after three hours or so. So remember the pan is hot, so put a towel on the handle. Remember, you're taking this out of the oven. That's important, right? So be sure the lid handle is also hot too. So we're gonna remove this lid handle altogether out of the way. And let's see what we have. If our nice liquid we want to baste the meat, nice and tender. Really beautiful. So that braise, you can see a braise, how that works. I'm going to uh, now put the beef stew, the nice pieces to drain. So they're nice and tender, it really smells quite spectacular. And the beef is nice and tender. And the chuck has all that nice fats, it gives it such great flavor. Well, the, so what I'm doing now is removing the beef from the liquid, the nice beef cubes from the liquid because I now want to thicken that liquid with my beurre manier. So I'm gonna turn on the heat a little bit. All right, see? There is, um, there's, there's no grease to speak of in there. Now the handle's hot, <laughs> I've been touching it. I'm gonna add a little wine. Add just a little more wine to that, okay? We're using the nice McManus California Pinot Noir. It's a Burgundy, right? So Pinot Noir is our Burgundy wine. So McManus is from Ripon, California, Central Valley. So I want that to, to, uh, to simmer. And I'm gonna add some of my beurre manier because I want that to thicken, to be nice and thick. So I made a smaller batch, as you can see, of beef stew, beef bourguignon. 
So the burn money, we add it to let it simmer. We add that. Someone asked if we can use the tenderloin instead of the chuck. Well, if the tenderloin, the tenderloin is very tender, so you wouldn't braise the tenderloin. You can saute or grill a tenderloin and make the burgundy sauce. That's a great idea, by the way. Grill a um, T-bone steak or, or a porterhouse or a filet mignon, and then um, Make the burgundy sauce. Look at that, some nice liquid there. Add, add, make a burgundy sauce and put on a steak. Yeah, why not? But you couldn't braise a uh, tenderloin because it would, well, it's, it's tender. For that reason, there'd be no need to braise it. So now we add the shrooms. On low heat. And then the pearl onions, the nice pearl onions to that. Well, this is a beautiful dish. A few extra for me to eat later on. And we stir that. There's the bay leaf. And now we're going to dish that up in our Nice uh, Bergogna place setting here today. So this is a very special Bepeguillon. It's just a comforting flavor and the tastes are so wonderful. And the combinations, the mouthfeel, it's very, very special. It's very wonderful. It's a magnifique, actually. So, um, finish off today's uh, class. We're presenting um, a very nice Pinot Noir, Big Manis from Ripon, California. This is a beautiful dish, it's really special. Uh, it's very comforting, it's very savory, it's very flavorful, and I hope you'll make this recipe. And if there aren't any more questions, we'll wait a few more moments in case there are any questions, just speak them out and I'll hear them. And uh, that'll be great. One more coming in. Yeah, early in my, when I started the, uh, the session, I mentioned that a beef stew is fully submerged and smaller in pieces. That's correct. And a braise is partially submerged in liquid. So a bœuf bourguignon is a uh, uh, French beef stew. Uh, it means beef burgundy, but uh, it's known as a French beef stew. But it actually, it's not stewed because we don't use the term beef braise as a culinary term. We say beef stew. But you're correct, it's in fact braised, and that is obvious because it's covered half with liquid. Great observation and very accurate. You can have a starch, bread, or potato So if someone wants to know if we can add a starch to that. What's classic with this dish is uh, pomme vepper parsier, which is a fancy name for steamed parsley potatoes. That goes very well with that. Also, a green salad is very nice as well, and a, a French baguette that complements the meal. It's sort of the one that Julia Child prepared uh, a little those many years ago. So yes, uh, steamed parsley potato, green salad, and a nice baguette, and of course, a, a red burgundy wine. So this is a great dish. You'll really enjoy uh, preparing. We look forward to seeing your pictures. Uh, email us at Chef Mark at escoffieronline.com. We're happy to take your questions. Don't forget to, to, hear, to listen to us or find out about our trip to France this October. And uh, we appreciate your participating with us today. And we thank you for being here with us. And I will be on the chat for the next 15 minutes, uh, typing in your questions, responding to you. Thanks to those who visit us from South America and from Europe and from the United States. We appreciate having you here today. Wish you bon appetit and have a nice day. Bye bye.